Good evening, all of you. This is Deepthi on behalf of Talks, welcoming each one of you onto this virtual platform. As Rishmi has already said, this is our first venture along with Daksh Event Management Group. And now we are going to start the highlight of the program, Dr. N.G. Narendranath Memorial Oration. This is the eighth on the row. And we have got our esteemed speaker, Dr. Arul Kumaran, sir, waiting from UK to join with us. Dr. Narendranath, sir, was my senior and a very wonderful person. We remember him in our prayers. I'm sure his family members are watching this show from across the globe. Without much delay, may I now hand over this session over to the chairpersons of this uh, talk, that is Dr. Ambujam, KFOC president, Dr. Nishi Roshni, talks president, and Dr. Venugopal, KFOC secretary. Over to you, our esteemed chairpersons. Very good evening to all of you. It's my, it's my uh, proud privilege to introduce to you today Dr. M. G. Narendranath. He is the, the oration today is named after Dr. M. G. Narendranath or Narendran as all of us used to know him. He was a good friend of mine. Always he had two words to say as words of comfort. He would always say that it's all about the timing and he would always say that everything will be all right. I think these two things are very relevant in the modern day and under the current scenario. Narendran was born on 16th May 1962 in, in Trishur. He did his schooling from Model Boys School Trishur and his MBBS from Government Medical College Trishur. He did his MD from Calicut Medical College 1995. Immediately after his MD, he trained in advanced gynecological laparoscopic surgery at the National University Hospital, Singapore. He took a diploma in gynecological endoscopic surgery at the University of Kiel, Germany, and then he joined Kraft Kodungalur. And he worked in Kraft Kodungalur up to the year 2006. And then after that, subsequently, he joined Westford Hospital and was there and worked there since 2006. More than a formal introduction to him, he was a good friend of mine. He was a wonderful doctor. He was liked by all his patients and uh, all his colleagues alike. And uh, he was a very good uh, clinician with areas such as infertility and endoscopy as his specialization. Uh, there have been uh, many uh, Narendra orations prior to this, but today we are really privileged and I am very happy that in the, an oration held in the memory of my friend Narendran is being given by none other than Sir Arul Kumaran. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, I would like to thank... Sir, uh, now I, I think I, it's my duty now to introduce oh. um, our guest speaker, Professor Sir S. Arul Kumaran. He is a Professor Emeritus of St. George University of London. He is the president. He was the president of FIGO past president. He was also past president of the British Medical Association. He is also the emeritus editor of Bloom. And we all know that he was also the past president and past vice president of Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, UK. He is an honorary fellow as well as visiting professor to many postgraduate and ONG colleges and universities all over the world. He is an author of 260 indexed publications, 30 books, more than 200 book chapters, and he is also the editor in chief of best practice and research in clinical obstetrics and gynecology. He was awarded the Knight Bachelor in recognition of his services to medicine and health services by Her Majesty the Queen in the birthday honors list in June 2009. He is also the recipient of Sri Lanka Ranjana National Honors Award from the President of Sri Lanka in 2019. His field of research is mainly in all the fields of obstetrics, mainly premature 
rupture of membranes, induction of labor, fetal heart rate monitoring, and also management of postpartum hemorrhage by condom tamponade, compression sutures, suction, curatage, suction uh, management, etc. And proudly presenting to you, Professor Sir Arul S. Kumaran, to his talk, Oration on Redefining labor, Intrapartum Labor Care Based on Recent Evidence. Over to you, sir, for the oration. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to pay my tribute to uh, Dr. Narendra Nath. I have met him some time ago, uh, and uh, my greatest admiration for the society for having a memorial oration on his name. I would also fail in my duty if I don't thank Professor Piley, Deepthi, Anbrijam, Risha Rosha, and Vern Gopal for inviting me, and also my uh, friend Aswat Kumar, who is participating in this ceremony. So thank you very much for everyone. I've chosen this subject about redefining intrapartum care based on recent evidence. And I hope uh, you can see my slides if I put it on full screen. So I'm going to take three areas in intrapartum care. One is about management of labor. The second part about fetal surveillance, whether we can improve it. And third is about postpartum hemorrhage, including placenta accreta, because the first is important because the cesarean section rates are going up and up because we are not managing labor adequately. And also partly the fetal surveillance, if we are not doing properly, then we are ending up with a constant rate of cerebral palsy, and maternal deaths are increasing because we are not managing PPH and placenta accreta properly. So in my talk, I will cover these three areas. First, may I take this to this paper about preventing first cesarean delivery, because in vast majority of centers, the majority of cesarean sections are due to a repeat cesarean section. So if we can prevent the first cesarean delivery, then we can bring this epidemic to a plateau. And when we look at the indication based on two large papers, one from Zhang and other from Barbara et al., we can see the indications before labor, that is elective, malpresentation, hypertensive disorders, maternal request. But in labor, it's first stage of labor arrest. It's about 15 to 30%. And in second stage, 10 to 25, failed induction, 10, and non-reassuring fetal heart rate, 10. So the vast majority are due to labor problems. And you're going to hear Professor Piley talk about instrumental delivery about second stage issues. So I'm going to focus on first stage arrest and also non-reassuring fetal heart rate. Now, if you take in the cesarean section by way of Robson's group classification, then the highest cesarean sections are due to nulliparous women with singleton cephalic pregnancy after 37 weeks in spontaneous labor, which indicates that we are not managing labor properly. And the secondly, nulliparous women who are either induced or who have a C-section for some other reason. And of course, as expected, number five, Robson's classification is one previous uterine scar, which many women don't like to go through another repeat labor or the clinicians themselves don't want to have them in labor because of fear of scar rupture. Now, all this problem was trying to be resolved by Friedman in 1954. He thought he might introduce something which can reduce C-section unnecessarily due to labor problems. But there was a problem with this paper because a lot of people have talked about Friedman's curve. But if you look at the original paper of graphic analysis of labor. He described 100 cases, 68 were forceps deliveries, one C-section, one frank breach, four were induction with oxytocin, 15 augmentation. So this is not truly uh, analysis of normal labor. These are abnormal cases put into, and 22 cases of caudal anesthesia. Anyhow, when you look at what he did, if you look at the bottom line, you can say he described it as normal labor, figure one normal labor, primary parad term. And he said latent phase is seven hours because they dilate at 0.3 centimeters per hour. An active phase is maximum slope is 1.1 centimeter per hour. So he defined latent and active phase and a sigmoid curve, which tapers at the end. 
So this is based on 100 cases, which are not really normal in any way. Now, Phil Pott from South Africa jumped into the bandwagon, and he thought we will use this and convert an alert line at one centimeter per hour in the first stage of labor after three centimeter dilatation. And he thought it will be acceptable for African primary gravity. But later he realized that the African primary gravities don't dilate the same way and the head doesn't descend the same way because they normally tend to have an anthropoid type of pelvis. So cervix dilates fully and then suddenly head comes down. So the rate of cervical dilatation because the head was not going down was much lower than the American patients described by Friedman. Anyway, because there were lots of uh, uterine ruptures and uterine vesicovaginal fistula, he thought he must get these women before they run into trouble. So he said we will have an inclination of one centimeter power as the rate of cervical dilatation as the slowest 10, 10%. And uh, following him, Kirian or Driscoll from Ireland also decided they will take one centimeter per hour. But as you can see, that Kirian Audrey's call had 55% of nulliparous women stimulated with oxytocin because they were deviating from away to the right from one centimeter per hour. So there's something not wrong. How can you define 55% of women to be not normal? So there's a problem in how they manage both Philpot and Friedman. So the WHO then started to look at this issue about this conflicting ways of looking at one centimeter per hour and then oxytocin or fill pots one centimeter and four hours to the right and to start oxytocin. So there was a technical group which was formed in 1987. They look at alert line and if it is one centimeter per hour, it's the alert line after three centimeters and if it is to the right, um, then you had consider action, but if it is left, there's no action needed. And uh, once it reaches four hours, then action line. So they had to be transferred in some way. And this photograph, everybody is familiar. The top part is about fetal heart rate. The second is cervical dilatation. You can see the alert and action line. Then about contractions, oxytocin, and maternal parameters in the bottom half of the paper. Now, I was involved in this drawing the WHO partogram with Barbara Cost, who was a midwife who worked at Philpot and Christopher Lennox, who worked in Papua New Guinea. So this is the construction we made. We made eight hours as the latent phase, and then one centimeter per hour as alert line and four hours to the right as action line. Not only we constructed this, we wrote a protocol and did a study uh, in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. And I was in charge of the uh, trial in Indonesia. So the principle was active phase starts at three centimeters, it takes about eight hours for it to get active phase. Then after that, one centimeter per hour, then four hours to the right, you start acting, but don't do an examination before four hours. And we showed in a paper in the Lancet that it might improve or reduce the C-section. Now that was going on for a long time till 2002, when people realized using the WHO paragraph, the C-sections were going up and up despite oxytocin use. So here there's a picture showing Friedman's two papers, 55 and 78, and Zhang, who looked at 1,329 nulliparous women and published in 2002. And if you look at the graph very carefully, the increase or the active phase seems to start at five centimeters rather than at three centimeters. So you can see this difference at about 10 hours and the lower scale that it starts going up and up and up. In 2010, which is about eight years later, Zhang again looked at 62,000 women and constructed the late rate of progress in nulliparous women, which is P0, P1, and P2. And he again maintained that the active phase starts at five centimeter per hour. And when we look at the figures numerically, then you can see that you can see the figures numerically that the median number of hours for the cervix to dilate from five to six is 0.8. But if you take it three to four centimeters, it takes 1.8 hours. In some, it takes eight hours. So in reality, 
Point eight hours seems to be, or after five to six centimeters, seems to be a rapid increase. But before five centimeter, it is not, and that is based on Zhang study and other study as well. So we had to redefine labor active phase as five centimeters. Now, American College took this into consideration, and they maintained that the uh, rate of dilatation is five to six centimeters is 0.8, and uh, the 95th centile is 3.2 hours for it to dilate. So this is actually the Zhang's one, and the American College redefined it. So I won't labor too much about it, but going back to uh, 1987. I don't know whether the, the slides are moving on your screen. Uh, now I can see my paper and this is going to be fine. So let us carry on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Friedman then came back later and said he never defined that four centimeters should be the active phase and he was a bit puzzled about why they started this ball rolling that three centimeters should be the transient point between the latent and active phase. So the WHO then decided they had to resolve all this issue. Then they, started, they did a study called the better outcomes in labor difficulty. So it was a five-year study. And it, not only they did the study prospectively in Africa, but also they did some primary research looking at what the woman would like to have and what the guidelines are saying. So they looked at the bold study and wanted to redefine labor. And what they did was they looked at the simplified effective labor monitoring action. So they didn't intervene anywhere as alert action line. They let the women go into labor and just followed them on eight hours, 10 hours, 15 hours, 20 hours, it didn't matter, and to look at it. In the meantime, they also did a questionnaire as to what their women thought was important for them in, in their labor process. So this is actually the bold study results published by Oladapo, Olufemi Oladapo from WHO. As you could see, the active phase seems to be starting at five centimeter, whether they are P0, P1, or P2. So Zhang's presumption seems to be correct in African primary gravid and multigravid as well. They tried to construct the graph in different ways, whichever way they constructed the increase of one centimeter per hour seems to be starting at five centimeter per hour. So the current conclusion is that the, what we thought for a long time, three centimeter is the transition point should be shifted to five centimeters per hour before we start. And this is actually the bold study graphs. These black lines coming one after the other are the different labors in nulliparous women. As you could see, they are dilating at all sorts of speeds and the outcome in many of them are normal. Both the mother and the baby were normal. There was no issues about fistula or fetal distress or infection or anything like that. So this is P0. But if you go to P1 and P2 and plot the graphs, as you could see the black lines appearing one after the other. And again, the picture was the same. Many of them dilated very quickly, but a lot of them dilated very slowly. But still, there were no maternal or neonatal complications. So they decided that maybe we should take labor as it progresses and give more time, not necessarily one centimeter per hour and four hours to the right, but if the mother is coping well, baby is coping well, then we should give her time, but we might have a cutoff at the 95th centile. So they want to redefine how we look at labor. So this is the original WHO partogram. As you could see, we are going to plot the individual labor based on the alert and action line. So as you could see, now the individual labors are plotted on the original alert and action line. Now, the alert and action line was brought in initially to prevent maternal and fetal complications. And as you could see, these are babies with good outcome at the topic, all women with good outcome for the mother and baby. And there are a lot of them who went 15, 16, 18, 20 hours in labor. As you could see, thousands of them, because the study was 10,000 cases, so you can imagine there was no problems as we thought that the labor, if it is a little bit longer, will end up in maternal and fetal complications. Now, obviously, there are cases which ended up in poor complications as well. So those will be plotted in this red line. 
So as you could see in the red line, there were cases who had shorter labors and problems as well as longer labors and problems. So it is to do with individual labor rather than merely a factor of the length of labor. So the WHO had to redefine what to do and they looked at numerical values. And if you look at this um, table of all the studies done, Zhang, Zuki, Zhang, et cetera, and the weighted overall median is given at the bottom. And the bottom says how many hours it takes to dilate from two to three or three to four or four to five and so on. Only when you look at five to six centimeters, then it is dilating at one hour. After that, it is dilating less than one hour by each centimeter. So the conclusion was till about five centimeter, we had to be a little bit conservative and we shouldn't really plot the graph or part of graph and then intervene. So that was the conclusion of the Bull study. This is actually in multiparous women, it's the same. So the earlier one was primiparous, this is multiparous. And again, if you look at five to six centimeter, um, five to six centimeter is the point where it is coming at one hour for one centimeter, five to six. After that, it is shorter than one hour to dilate each centimeter. So you could consider five centimeter as the turnoff point for it to happen. Now, the study of Bohl was also to look at the attitude of the healthcare providers. The attitude of the healthcare providers, um, attitude of the healthcare providers and the patients as to what they would expect out of labor. And they came with some understanding that the women will want to have normal birth without intervention. They want a healthy mother and baby support from a birth companion, desire to be on control and sensitive, care, kind, respectful staff. These are what they wanted on a qualitative study. So women wanted a positive experience of childbirth and giving birth to a healthy, clinically and psychologically safe environment. So WHO decided we had to mix these two, the qualitative study and the quantitative study and come up with something. And the result of this is actually to have a few important components respectful care, women express the need for support. So we had to provide respectful care, good communication, so they know what is happening. Labor companion, either mother, sister, and so on, and essential physical resources. And there should be some information which is completed and fed in a timely fashion, not to fill in a retrospective paradigm. Now, this is similar to the Manyata program in India taking the qualitative aspects as well. And this is, the partogram is now called the WHO Labor Care Guide. So now this looks very complicated. So I'm going to break this into portions and show you. The first portion, the upper portion has identification and admission data. So the name, parity, labor onset, number of uh, ruptured membranes, and then the qualitative feature, whether there was a companion available and if there's a companion available, there are some alert feature which is given throughout. So please remember the alert feature in the blue two lines. There's no companion, it says N. Pain relief, no N. If it is Y, that means companion is present and pain relief is present. Oral fluid given, supine posture, put them onto the side. And first stage, and also they incorporated the second stage, at least three hours of second stage to be there. So this takes care of the qualitative data. So if there's no companion throughout, that means we know that by Cochrane database, a companion at birth reduces intervention. So we have to really pay attention, pain relief, oral fluids, and posture has to be managed. Section three and four are to do with baby and the care of the mother. So the baseline fetal heart rate and fetal heart rate deceleration L is late, V is variable, E is early, so they can mark it here, and also they can put the baseline rate. So what is uh, notable to be higher alert is if the heart rate goes to 160 or more, or if there are late decelerations, or heart rate is less than 110. Similarly, there's meconium of blood, they should be alerted. OPOT alerted, caput 3 plus, molding 3 plus. So, this will be plotted and if there is no, none of these features, then that will be virtually in green. But if it goes to these alert features, then it is marked in red. So people know there are too many reds, both in the heart rate and 
amniotic fluid, then we know things are not going wrong well. And maternal pulse, blood pressure, if the systolic is more than 140, the pulse is more than 120, then it's an alert feature, or diastolic greater than 90. And similarly, temperature and urine, protein as well as acetones, it's a problem. Then the progress of labor. This is the most important one related to the original partygram. If the contractions are less than two in 10 minutes or more than five in 10 minutes, then that's a bad thing to be alerted. And duration, if it is less than 20, then probably she needs some augmentation. If it is more than 60 seconds, then probably you have to temper the oxytocin down if she's on oxytocin already. And the cervix, it, because the length of labor was so variable, if she was admitted in five at five centimeters, then you can give her a lot of time unless the cervix doesn't change for five to six hours, you don't have to intervene. And if she's at nine centimeters, then within two hours, the cervix should change. And this is the descent, the head descent in zero, five fifths, four fifths, three fifths, and so on. So this alert feature signifies to the midwife there is a problem in various features of labor. And finally, the medication and birth outcome. So medication can be oxytocin, IV fluids, and assessment of the patient overall, and the plan based on all the findings you came across, that companion should be present, oral fluid should be given, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, the outcome by mode of birth, blood loss, neonatal status, Abgasco, and so on. And as you could see, the alert features are given here at the box. If it is yes, N, decline, D, unknown, and so on, protein, acetone, and so on. So it's called a companion or the labor care guide rather than a partygram by the WHO. So currently, trials are being done, and it'll come out in no time. Now I'm going to move on to the next section of fetal surveillance. This is a paper I did in 1990 because we put a scalp electrode and a maternal reference electrode and we thought if we measure the ECG of the baby, then that might be a better indicator or with the fetal heart rate, it'll be good. Because the fetal heart rate, the accelerations and the variability indicate the central nervous system function, whereas the ECG indicates the heart function of the baby. So I wrote that paper in 1980 saying it should improve fetal surveillance. And the idea is actually the baby's myocardium as glycogen. And when there is a hypoxic stress, catecholamine dissolves the glycogen and puts into the heart muscle, to the glucose. And with that goes the potassium. So you get a rise in T wave and an ST wave. So we did a lot of studies on that. And we did this, the first clinical study in the UK in 2002 to 2007. We looked at 1,500 cases at St. George's. And there were 14 cases of neonatal encephalopathy despite the use of ECG. So our conclusion was that the CTG interpretation and adherence to guidelines was not taken into consideration. And Cochrane did a detailed analysis of about 27,000 women, and they also came to the same conclusion about 15 years later. This paper was by Jim Nielsen in 2015. And that's the last one available. And as you could see, there are only two things which impacted. One is the fetal blood sampling rate went down because the ECG waveform gave a better prognosis whether the baby's running into trouble or not. The second, operative vagina delivery rate came down, but not cesarean section, not metabolic acidosis, and not neonatal encephalopathy. So it was a bit of a disappointment. So where do we go from there from fetal ECG? Well. Phil Steer and his group thought they would interpret the CTG by computer science because they thought even in the ECG CTG, you had to combine both and CTG reading was the problem. So they introduced a machine, K2, called Ladder of Concern. If the computer says the CTG is running, if it is green, nothing to worry, blue, some minor concerns, yellow, serious concern, red, major concern. So the screen will look like this. And as you could see, the red signal comes as severe deceleration and the bar will come as red or yellow or green. And also it will tell you the problem, severe decelerations and contracts are too frequent. So this was called the infant study with nearly 45,000 
uh, women in labor. And uh, this decision support is with the computer. No decision support is manual. And there's no difference in intrapartum stillbirth, neonatal death, moderate neonatal encephalopathy, and babies in poor condition. Now, the chance of an intrapartum stillbirth in this 45,000 was 1 in 15,000. That's only three babies died out of 45,000 cases. Now, on the other hand, the CTG was in both arms. If you compare the stillbirth rates in 1985 Dublin trial, there was one intrapartum stillbirth in 2,200. So you can see over the years, it has dropped dramatically from over 30 years. It has dropped from one in 2,000 to one in 15,000. So that means there's some improvement which has been made, whether you do it by decision support or no decision support. So it might be better CTG interpretation is the answer. Now, they also looked at upgas scores, cord artery pH, metabolic acidosis, C-section, there was no difference at all. So they came to the conclusion that doing a, using a computer is not going to help us to reduce. So they looked at recognition of abnormal pattern, it picked up, but there might be problem to failure to act. But the most important factor they have identified was failure to identify the additional risk factors. For example, where there is a uterine hyperstimulation, where there is a cord prolapse, where there is a partial placental insufficiency, and so forth, a meconium. And uh, they looked at the substandard care in this major trial. And as you could see, the substandard care was divided into zero. That means no problem. One minor errors, two moderate errors, and three, you would have done something different. You could have saved the life of the baby. And they were... 38 cases equal on both computer arm and the other arm that you could have changed the fate of the baby in terms of neonatal death, stillbirth, and metabolic acidosis if you would have acted differently. And the major outcome they identified was actually they didn't pay attention to antenatal and intrapartum risk factors. So in other words, CTG is a test. And if it is wrong, then you must really look at the maternal age, look at the BMI, look at the oxytocin, look at meconium and take a combined decision-making rather than on one. So the conclusion of the infant study was actually to pay attention to the clinical risk factors as mentioned, which every one of us know, but sometimes we don't pay attention to that. And the same study or similar study was repeated by Diago de Campos looking at computer analysis of the CTG and the ECG together. And computer analysis of both component even did not give rise to better outcome. So still we are struggling with this. And like the airplane pilots, although there is computer to assist, they do a number of tests every six months. So the pilot will undergo 100 tests during his lifetime every six months. Whereas the doctors, when they passed out, they don't have any uh, test at all. Only if there is a disciplinary action, then they asked the midwife or doctor whether they are competent to uh, interpret the CTG. So I think the computer at the moment is like an autopilot. It might help a little bit, but I think we had to really gear up the thing. So this is going to be the final answer, I think. That is, earlier on, we had the conventional fetal monitor, then we had the computer analysis and ECG waveform, but we need something more. And that something more is called machine learning, that is the machine or the CTG computer itself reads itself and sees which pattern gave rise to bad outcome. For example, we don't have interdeceleration interval as part of the parameter in our CTG interpretation. We don't have the depth and duration of deceleration as part of the interpretation. We just look at the shape and size and give our verdict. So this the machine learning will be able to find out the depth and duration of the deceleration, the interdeceleration interval, because the interdeceleration interval comes shorter and shorter, then there is a problem. So it'll be like a car with sensors. So if the car gets closer to the other car, it'll have a, like a sound, as you can see in your cars, they say bleep, 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 when they are reversing. And if you are coming very close, it is a bleep, 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 and then finally bleep and it is going to crash into something else. So the machine learning mechanism is going to come in and we call it unassisted machine learning. So we don't put our findings into the computer system. 
we feed hundreds of thousands of CTGs and outcome into the machine and the machine will learn which type of things, including the clinical parameters, can be fed in for it to pick up. So there are some trials going on at the moment. So hopefully it will come out in the next five to six years. Now, for those who are using intermittent auscultation, I think we can make simple improvements. This is a digital display of a, a Doppler machine. And you can, by switch, one small switch on the Doppler, you can convert into a graph. Because when you see numbers, you don't know whether it's an acceleration or deceleration when it goes up and down. But if you have a graph, then you can really, and there's a memory chip inside, you can store the data as well. Because a uh, trace like this, you might get the rate, but you won't get the variability and the decelerations unless you have a graphic display. So I move on to the last part of my talk, which is about postpartum hemorrhage. In many countries, the oxytocin used is not very effective because the half-life of oxytocin is 8 to 12 minutes. We need the uterus to be contracted for 48 to 60 minutes, like many of us put an oxytocin drip. So we need a long-acting oxytocin with less side effects, plus also a heat-stable oxytocin because 50 to 60% of the oxytocins get denatured when you store it outside during transport in large containers in the ship. So there's a new formulation available, heat-stable carbatosin, and it's heat-stable for 24 months at 30 degrees centigrade. So this is going to be made available in all developing countries. There's a large study called the Champion Study done. And in UK, we are using for C-section, but certainly it is going to move into vaginal delivery as well. Now, one of the problem with the Champion Study was because it has to be double-blind study, both heat stable and the standard oxytocin was kept in the refrigerator. If the standard oxytocin was kept outside, then the results might have been different. But nevertheless, one thing is for sure, the heat stable carbatosin is not inferior to the standard oxytocin, provided it is kept at the temperature uh, uh, as expected. But more importantly, it will last for 48 to 60 minutes. So that's the major advantage. So the Cochrane looked at this and reanalyzed the data in April 2018. And this was their conclusion. If you are going to get the best effect, then you have to give ergometrine and oxytocin in combination, which is symptometrin, or carbatosin only, or misoprostol and oxytocin. So oxytocin alone, they didn't think it was much effective compared to this combination. This is ranking in order. The first three were ergometrine and oxytocin, carbatosin, or misoprostol and oxytocin. But carbatosin has the least side effects among the top three uterotonins. Now, in December 2018, they revised this meta-analysis called network meta-analysis because there are so many compounds used, but there is no direct comparison. So the network meta-analysis, if you compare A with B and B with C, then you can really compare C with D, then you can cross-compare this and see what is the effective. And based on this network meta-analysis by Cochrane, there were 196 randomized control trials with 134,000 uh, women in labor. And they said the most effective drugs are three, sintometrine, combination of mesoprostol and oxytocin, or carbatosin. And the standard drug we give oxytocin is effective, but the other three are more effective than uh, oxytocin alone. So, but the combination uterotonics have adverse side effects. So this is given in the WHO uh, recommendation as well, but the recommendation is actually that only when the drug becomes available uh, at the same price. So recommendation 1.2, use of carbatosin 100 microgram is recommended for the prevention of PPH for all births in context where it costs comparable to the other effective uterotonics for PPH prevention only. There's no trial done with carbatosin for treatment. So we have to remember that carbatosin heat stable, long acting is for prevention. I'll move on to another small story about crash two study. Crash two is when there is an accident victim by the roadside. If you give tranexamic acid one gram by the roadside, I suppose to bring the patient to the hospital and give tranexamic acid because of pelvic fracture or whatever it is. The death rate can be reduced by 30% if you give the tranexamic acid by the roadside. 
And earlier you give the tranexamic acid betates. So this is in trauma. That's called the CRASH-2 study. And if it is more than three hours, the clock is very loose and it doesn't have the same impact. So based on the same principle, the woman trial was done of early tranexamic acid administration. What it does is actually it blocks the plasmin acting on fibrin and fibrinogen and degrading and stabilizing the clot. So it doesn't promote clotting, but it stabilizes the clot. And the trial with nearly 20,000 patients showed that you can significantly reduce the maternal deaths due to bleeding. It won't reduce the deaths due to other causes like organ failure, eclampsia, sepsis, and so on. But due to bleeding, certainly it has an impact. And the earlier you give, the better it is. And if whether it's vaginal delivery or C-section, you can give it. And whether it's uterine attorney or even trauma, it doesn't matter. It'll help in reducing the bleeding. So I think tranexamic acid one gram, if it doesn't work, then over 10 minutes, slowly, and then 30 minutes later, you can give another gram. There are other concerns about this study, whether it'll cause venous or arterial thrombosis, and there doesn't seem to be any of those problems. So you can see venous events and arterial, whether you have tranexamic acid or placebo is the same. So you don't have to worry about giving tranexamic acid. And systemic complications all the same, whether it's in placebo or in tranexamic acid, cardiac failure, respiratory failure. These are not due to tranexamic acid. This could be due to the combined condition of the patient. She might be preeclamptic and cardiac failure or renal failure. So both are almost equal, whether she had tranexamic acid or placebo. So if you look at death due to bleeding, postpartum hemorrhage and CRASH-2 study, 40,000 patients put together, then it certainly reduces the death by 30%. And the immediate treatment is more effective, 30% improvement. And every 15 minute delay, there is a 10% reduction in the survival. And after three hours, there's no benefit. So if you're going to give tranexamic acid, it's a plot which you can say, once it comes to about treatment delay by 135 minutes, it becomes less and less by 180 minutes you can see there is no impact at all of giving tranexamic acid. So the WHO came out with a protocol or guideline saying that it reduces laparotomy for bleeding, reduces death by a third, and did not reduce hysterectomy because most of these countries, they did a hysterectomy before even giving tranexamic acid. Now, recently, just about six months ago, we published this paper. And this is from my small group from my home country in Jaffna which I combined with uh, Mohandan. And what we did was actually, we got postpartum women who had just delivered as volunteers and gave them oral tranexamic acid. And we found out how long does it take oral tranexamic acid to take active concentration. And we concluded that within one hour, the oral administration of one gram or two grams, if you like, will raise the concentration of tranexamic acid in the blood and the half-life is 1.65 1, 1. hours. So you can imagine that you can recommend giving tranexamic acid orally uh, in places where you can't give intravenously. And there need to be a larger study, a clinical study, because this is a pharmacological study showing it will be effective. The next thing, another paper which we published last year was, whatever you do with tranexamic acid, the principal determination of death, these are 483 women, the problem seems to be late presentation, maternal anemia, availability of blood transfusion, and poor infrastructure. So whether you give tranexamic acid or not, the chance of survival is better if you can transport the woman earlier, if you can prevent maternal anemia and available blood transfusion to overcome the problem. This is a suction device, which I show, you put it into the through the cervix, have a balloon at the cervix and suck it and collapse the uterus uh, as opposed to the uh, distending the uterus with a balloon, as you could see. The, this is just a standard suction loop used for surgery, bent into a loop and the outer holes are covered and it goes in and there's a balloon there which really occludes the cervix to bring it or collapse it down. This is not a new idea, as you could see, 
There have been other studies done in Kerala by Samatana Ram and Vasudeva Panika, who are published as well. It's a good concept, and there's a large trial which is going on comparing balloon tamponade versus vacuum tamponade. So that'll tell us which way to go, and it is a crossover trial, so we are waiting the results. I had to acknowledge Professor Piley as one of the pioneers in developing postpartum hemorrhage treatment, and these are parasomic glands, which is similar to tying the uterine artery. So while you want to transfer, you can put it on both sides, as you can see in the picture. So that is going to be life-saving because the copious amount of blood, 500 to a liter of blood goes through this uterine circulation. So if you can clamp it down, then the woman will be in a better condition. As I showed you in our paper as well, the delay causes the problem. So if you can really train people using these models, then so much the better. Now going to placenta accreta, we have to make up our mind whether you want to do a hysterectomy. And if it is going to do a hysterectomy, don't remove the placenta because that's the first cardinal sin. If you put the hand to remove the placenta, there will be torrential hemorrhage. The second thing is there are new blood vessels like a finger size without adventitia pulsating like a, a vein pulsating between the bladder base and the uterus. So you have to tie them off individually. So this is some pictures from Palacios Jorikimuda from Argentina. And he has demonstrated that new blood vessels, when you use a swab and hold and push it, then it has torrential bleeding. Now Edwin Chandrangaran, who was my senior lecturer, identified that we can do better. That is, if you have a placenta, we decided to do a triple P procedure. So what we did was actually in the theater, we identified where the placental upper margin is. And then from the placental upper margin, we made an incision. So we call the first piece uh, placental localization. And then we deliver the baby. And then we cut the placenta in the lower segment. Even part of the placenta is on the uterine vessel wall, but you cut it about three centimeters above the blood and remove the placenta as a chunk. So the triple pull procedure is, before that we do a placement of the uh, internal iliac and to the uterine vessel, a balloon to occlude so that we can have not less vascularity. Then we, after we deliver the baby, then we occlude the internal iliac vessel and then we cut it, take it out and re-suture. So that is called the triple P procedure. So that is called uh, placental localized placement of uh, in catheter. So you can use a bulldog clamp, if you like, or tie the internal iliac. So this is actually pictures which show what it looked like. And you might need some per clot, which is a sealant over the oozing areas. And even if you leave some trophoblastic tissue, you remove it as much as possible, but it remodels itself quite well. And we have done studies looking at the uh, functional activity of the uterus in terms of menstruation, pain, and discomfort, and also ultrasound of the structure. It remodels itself quite well. And this is the latest paper of 50 cases of triple P procedures published late last year. And as you could see here, we had no hysterectomies in uh, 50 cases, the last 50 cases we did. And the women generally went home within four days. Um, some of them developed complications. Three had arterial thrombosis, one had uh, ureteric injury, and so forth. So there is some complications you would expect. And finally, as I mentioned, from the woman study of 383 cases of women death, one of the problems was anemia, second was non-availability of blood transfusion. So in Tanzania and Rwanda, they are using these drones to supply blood, group-specific blood, so that might be the way to go in the future to overcome the problem. So to conclude the PPH, I think prevention is better than treatment. Prevention uh, any time with uh, heat stable carbatacin, which is long acting. Early diagnosis and treatment before she loses 30% of blood. And hemostasis protocol, so first the medical and then surgical. Use of tranexamic acid is very useful. And Newer treatment as Professor Piley's clamps and other things are going to be extremely useful in any setting. So I would like to conclude saying I have reevaluated the care of in labor. Some interest about the uh, 
labor management itself, then about how the field of surveillance will attack uh, machine learning, because machine learning is now helping in looking at cervical smears, mammograms, uh, and so on. Those are all static, retinal screening, and so forth. But dynamic uh, parameters like fetal heart rate can be incorporated into machine learning. And some aspects in the third stage as uh, advances in prevention and management. So I would like to uh, thank Professor Piley, Deepthi, Anbujam, and others who are kindly invited me for this lecture and uh, wish you the very best with your continued planning and uh, conferences. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for enlightening us on the various aspects of labor management based on the most recent evidence. Thank you, sir. The oration is conferred on Professor Sir Chabaraknam Arul Kumaran and the citation is I'm reading the citation. Richur Obstetric and Gynecological Society, Dr. M. G. Narendranath Memorial Oration. The Trishur Obstetric and Gynecological Society is pleased to confer the Dr. M. G. Narendranath Memorial Oration for the year 2020 on Professor Sir Shabaratanam Arul Kumaran, Professor Emeritus, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, St. George's University Hospital, London, United Kingdom for the topic redefining intrapartum care based on recent evidence delivered at virtual talks conclave organized by the Trichur Obstetric and Gynecological Society. This oration is bestowed upon him in acknowledgement for of his universal contributions in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. As a teacher par excellence, he continues to help create the new breed of obstetricians and gynecologists to this day in pursuit of bridging the gap in sustaining the fraternity for tomorrow and in times to come spanning multiple generations. As the president of colleges, societies, federations and associations of global repute, he has spearheaded the best practice method in medical care as a shining example for others to emulate. His single-handed effort to keep the position of an obstetrician and gynecologist high is loaded across the world and is held in high esteem, which proves to be a moral support for the practitioner in this field. We wish him many years of good health and act as a beacon of light to guide the profession ahead. Date this day, first day of August 2020, Saturday, Tichur, Kerala, India. Signed by Dr. Nishi Roshni, President, Dr. Deepthi M, Secretary, Dr. Venugopal M, General Coordinator, Dr. Deshmi C R, Scientific Coordinator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.